Shall we start small um, with the... Um, uh, small as in, you know, about... Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, define small. <laughs> All right. Um, so first I'll go... I'll do a little bit of a teaser first. This is what I'm working on right now. This is where the sad story that I mentioned before comes in. Beautiful Hyenodon Horridus, scaled to a, a scale diagram of a skull, supposedly of Hyenodon Horridus, um, in a Jokul et al's, I think, 1999 paper about um, the sinuses of Hyenodons. And that is a fantastic study, and it's very interesting at all the different anatomical differences that clarify that this animal is actually not related to any carnivora at all. It's a very different category of animal altogether. It's at best maybe a member of foray. And if you're wondering why I've depicted it that way, it's because I'm using the most prototypical eutherian foray animal I could find. And that's pretty much what I ended up with. Is it that size? Alas, I tried to contact Jokul and I haven't been able to reach him. I have no idea. So no. it's either, you know, it could be an American specimen that's reassigned. It could have just been based on a um, something else. Keep in mind, this is actually very similar size to how big Hyenodon gigas grows. That's the largest species. So it's entirely possible that there are extra large horridices. Can't say for certain. They actually are probably wolf sized as commonly cited, and I will cover that soon. So this would be how big that skull diagram would show if it is indeed a horridus. I you can't say it's a horridus. Um, hmm? Whether the gigas and horridus are um, uh, like, are they ancestral via anagenesis or did they live at the same time in different places? Just to give a bit of an understanding. So I'm not 100% sure of the time. I think they might have lived in the same, I think, epoch, was it? Um, but they lived in different parts of the world. Um, right. Horridus is an American. Um, Gigas is Asian. Right. So they definitely lived in very different parts of the world. Um, so if this is a North Amer American hyenodon from, oh, I forget the name of that place, something river, fossil formation, then, well, that's something new we learned, but otherwise I can't say in any which way if that is the case. It's just something I saw in the study and used as my initial scaling reference, and that's all I could say for it. So say goodbye to Hyandon of unknown origin for now. I will hopefully be able to release it soon, one way or another. coming at some point. Stay tuned. <laughs> um... Okay, so moving on to something that will probably actually be a bit smaller than that hyenodon if, and something substantially larger, if that size Depends is correct, right? Yeah, we mm -hmm. will see in a second why. Behold, for the first time ever, I've put all three of these animals that people are curious about the relative sizes on in the same chart. The lion might have a bit of lower limb disproportion, so I'll revisit that at some point just to check because I've gotten a bit better at doing Leaf limbs, but otherwise, these general dimensions are very precise to um, the large known specimens of each one. This Smilodon populator is based on the very recent um, discovery, I think this year or, or yeah, late last year. Um, and excuse me. Oh, sorry. I was just trying to remember the. Um... Uh, the name of the who was uh, who who did the thingamajig, you know, the study. Oh yeah, I'm trying to remember too, and I should have actually wrote it here, but I didn't. I did write it on the individual remake I did. If you're wondering where it is, I actually just went to my old smiled on populated chart and replaced it with a much better one because sometimes if it's a really good artwork or really funny artwork, I just keep it as is, make a new one from scratch and just put a bunch of funny references to point out that you really need to see the new one. This one's obsolete. Just in case, you know, someone might, might you know, miss my old Bacillosaurus or they might, you know, miss um, my old Sp goofy Spinosaurus saying ahoy. So I left them there. In this case, I don't think anyone's going to miss the old, you know, splodgy looking populated with bad proportions. 
this one is very precisely proportioned and that's how big it should grow. And, and interesting, I found when I fixed up, you know, the hips and postures, which is a gripe I have with a lot of museum displays, they do weird assigning of where the bones go, or weird angles, and it's like, no, don't stop. When you straighten it out and then when you get it out of this weird slinky prowling crawling pose, it just has kind of a normal posture, really. It's just got a slightly taller shoulder and, but it can, you know, be straight as any other feeling. However, as you can see, the American lion here very much exceeds all of its obvious um, proportions. Um, it's, you know, obviously longer, taller, and it's also very bulky in its own right. So that's, um, you know, something to keep in mind, although there is possibly a bit of girth and bulk on its mass that might make uh, populator a little heavier. Although I think recent studies suggest the lion's heavier. So I've always been like, not sure about how, because they seem to jump around too much in terms of who was the heavier, who had the most robust muscle work, you know, and all that stuff and relative mm. to my length and stuff like that. Because, uh, like, previously was always uh, portrayed that Smilodon was, like, this slightly shorter but the bulkier and more muscular one than the lion. Then it kind of goes uh, the other way. Then uh, then the lion turns out to be taller. Then it's something else. Then it's something completely new. I just I always get confused with the big yeah. cat. I think well, the problem is, even though a lot of these animals could easily be reconstructed with something a little more thorough that takes into account the entire mass of the animal... A lot of studies love to just use something like femurs or skulls or some partial piece that doesn't really capture the full variability of this animal's mass. And so that's something to keep in mind. If they do something substantial like a computer-generated or volumetric analysis or something that doesn't rely on a single bone, that's probably better. However, there's a reason scientists use single bones, and that's because there's don't have a choice all the time. Some animals are just missing yeah. those bones, some are missing others, so they just work with what they got. But yeah, um, it's actually interesting. Sometimes a taller, thinner cat can actually be smaller than a shorter, stockier one. And you see that with lions and tigers or different species of modern lion, like the um, Transvaal lion against the Contango lion. I think the Transvaal is a little bit longer, taller. The Transvaal is just a short little beefcake, um, and the Transvaal ends up weighing a bit more, so yeah. the tra Transvaal is technically bigger. And I always find it funny when you compare the Transvaal and the Katanga line, and they actually are both the biggest lines in the world. They're huge. They're probably in the same league, at the very least, as Smilodon and the American line. Like, they're definitely more like these two felids than they are um, other lines. They're huge. And ironically, one kind of reminds me of um, the Fasa and the, that's the Katanga lions, while the Transvaal Kruger lions look a bit like Uncle Scar. So it's like, huh, yeah, you know that. The, yeah. And anyway, everyone's probably worrying, wondering about that giant creepy silhouette of the Utah Raptor in the background. This was me basically losing a wager with... Um, uh, one of my friends on DeviantArt who insisted that the Utah Raptor was bigger. I'm like, no, nah, that's crazy. I bet the line's bigger and I did an artwork than found all. Okay, never mind. I'll publish results. <laughs> Lose gracefully. It's And I'm doing that quite a bit at the moment. So um, just by, you know, sizing up things, I found that Tyrannosaurus is, and you know, relative size to other giant theropods and, Argentinosaurus against Patagotitan. I was like, oh, I might have been wrong about that now that I've actually been able to scale them up together. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. Well, Utah Raptor, as you can see, is nothing like usual raptors. It is a monster-sized beefcake. It's ironically following a similar body plan as Tyrannosaurus, where its limbs are a little bit smaller. Its back is heavier and thicker. Its head's large for its size, which is ironic because Tyrannosaurus didn't actually evolve into that direction. It just happened to have a common, an ancestor that happened to have all these features already. But that's pretty much that. Um, anything else you want me to say about it? Well, I mean, uh, I just wanted to add really that uh, this is one of the good ways to put it in perspective. And uh, mm. especially those who have always wondered, you know, who would, uh, how would, you know, you know how people like to go a bit crazy and they say, oh yeah, if they two ever met up and they started like having a territorial dispute or they would fight over a meal, 
who would be the more likely to win and take the cake, you know, so to speak. And uh, yeah. you can now tell that it's very likely going to be a Utah Raptor, even though mm. in mind uh, that that lion uh, or even that Smilodon would be able to give it a nasty smack in the head with their paws because cats, they hit really strong, even against something that is much bigger than them. Oh, yeah. They... Um... And this is an interesting fact. Giant felids can actually prey on large bears. This is actually the truth. They did some studies and found a... Um, they did some tracking devices of black bears in Siberia, and one of the four black bears got eaten by a Siberian tiger. Siberian tigers are... Reason... No. Oh, they're monsters. They're monsters. <laughs> Again, they're in the same league of size as these two. Siberian yep. tigers are nothing like the ones people see in the zoos. Siberian tigers are just monstrous beer moths. And that said, the reason they're so successful at this isn't so much because of their size, it's because they just sneak around, jump on the backs of whatever they want to eat. And by the time the animals realize what's happened, it's powerful jaws just kind of cracked its vertebrae already. So yeah. game over. Throat slit, whatever. Yeah, it's done. Yeah. So it's just, yeah, big cats aren't, always successful because they're big and strong they're also ridiculously sneaky and that's huge that's pretty much how they hunt that's why they're so successful today and that's pretty much it they're just as crafty as they're powerful if anybody ever uh, you know played the uh, uh yeah my son direct the, the sun direction changed so that's why my face is all illuminating just in case people were wondering what's going on <laughs> i don't have any blinds right now so it's gonna be a bit like that but uh, yeah uh, you know when you have a cat, a house cat, and sometimes if you pretend that you don't see them, they sometimes like to play sort of, and they kind of try to use your furniture to kind of sneak up on you and mm -hmm. uh, yep. sort of see it. But the moment you actually give them a sign and you turn around and be like, hi, I found you, you know, yep. they <laughs> jump, they charge, oh, they mock charge you mostly, and then they just like run away from you. They yeah. When I used to have a cat that did it to me all the time. Yeah, same so, with my two cats. They yeah, are. notice how they always try to sneak. If you pretend that you don't see them, they try to like sneak up on you and like playfully kind of mock charge you. Mine just attack me anyway. They think it's funny. <laughs> they they just go, oh, all right, I'm gonna charge, and they just charge and start biting me. It's like, no, you bad cat. <laughs> yeah. Like, Boy, but they like, love it. They purr. They they start purring. The little buggers. They yeah. Just... See, I think we probably covered everything about the felids. It's um, pretty much you know. Oh, so one last thing, keep in mind is a lot of people, assume, you know, call um, these cats saber-toothed tigers, and that is a misnomer. Not just because they're not tigers, because they're not even panthers. They're not even in the same family. They're just they're machairodonts, I think they're called, and that's like a completely different group of felids. So you have three groups. You have Actual cats, which also includes like cheetahs and mountain lions, is one very big, broad family. You have panthers, which are like the lions, tigers, jaguars, leopards, pretty much. Then you have the third extinct group, macrodonts, and they have all different body proportions. They're a different group altogether. As of recently, the one I've seen was uh, it recovers them that uh, philids actually are even a separate family from the macrodon. You know, macrodon. Really? Yeah, it's like a, you have a philid. Philidae, basically, or Philidae, and then you have Pantherinae, and you have Philinae as well. So Pantherinae... Wow, so that's like this, if anyone's seeing this uh, hand gesture. So this would be like uh, Philidae, Panthidae, and whatever this stem group is, and that would be Macrodons, but I'm guessing you're saying, like that? Yeah, something like that, yeah. It's uh, basically, you would have... Um, you would have basically uh, Philly Day would be definitely like a sister, maybe group to something there, or maybe it would be a couple steps down. I can't remember yeah. the tree exactly. All I remember is that the Philly Day itself is divided into Pantherinae and into Philinae. Pantherinae mm -hmm. includes basically lions, tigers, jaguars, and leopards, and uh, everything else that is alive today from all these cats that are, you know, like pumas, you know, cougars, you know, those ones are the biggest of the felinae. And everything smaller, that is all felinae. And felinae are the only ones, you know, obviously, that can, uh, they can meow and they can purr. Mm. Mentally, up to that. Yeah, that's right. They, but However, they can roar and growl um, much better. So yeah, yeah, they do it all the same or even like louder sometimes depending on like the situations. But uh, yeah, if you talk about uh, meowing and purring, then uh, pantherines uh, do not do that. Yep. 
So I think that probably covers it, I reckon. That's um I think that's it. All right, cool. Let's uh go to so what do you reckon we should do next? Um go, maybe go to uh, dinosaurs? Uh, yes, I think that's a very good idea. Um let's do uh theropods. Yeah, let's go with theropods, yeah. Let's go theropods. So I do actually um my recently updated Scotty versus that giant Spinosaurus that I very recently completed. So you can see the Spinosaurus right here. Yeah. Um, so this um, is actually very good timing because there's a lot of controversy around Spinosaurus. There's a lot of different theories about its proportions and size and relative different bits and pieces. Um, so, yeah, if there's any questions you want me to answer, I'm happy to cover what I found so far or... This is going to be interesting. So, um, I mean, obviously, I would, based on what it looks like, I would make, um, you know, a very safe assumption that you have used the latest Ibrahim 2020. Correct. Uh, and uh, I would probably be curious, how did you recover the, if you have any, you know, at all predictions of what would be your mass estimate for this reconstruction of the Spinosaurus that you got? All right, so I remember there was a recent study, I think it was actually before the tail was found, that put Spinosaurus in the seven ton range, maybe like, I forget, oh, it was a really good study. It had, it was Scotty's study, I think. I'm pretty sure it was the study about Scotty that, um, suggested that Spinosaurus was probably the next heaviest animal that wasn't a Tyrannosaurus. And and after that, Dinochirus and um, Giganotosaurus were roughly in the high six-ton range. But I think now that with the tail, which would certainly be actually increasing the mass and also the forelimbs, I would say it's quite a bit heavier, but mm, whether it's heavier than Tyrannosaurus, I really can't say. There's so many things that vary between these two animals. It would just be, you know, fine separating thread level of meticulous investigation that would really like recover. The Tyrannosaurus, at least based on your diagrams, just has a higher mass concentration in one area versus what Spinosaurus has a little bit more spread out. That's what yep, it's like to me. Mm -hmm. Yep, so obviously the legs of Tyrannosaurus would be like, th each leg would probably be three to four times bigger than a Spinosaurus leg, so that would massively tip the scales more to Tyrannosaurus. Its torso is probably thicker, at least at the rear, um, than the, the Spinosaurus. Width. Yeah, like sort of around the hip area. Um, around the thorax, you know, it probably starts matching, although Spinosaurus is obviously has a much longer thorax. The neck of Tyrannosaurus is thicker, but the Spinosaurus is longer. The head of Tyrannosaurus would be outright just larger. The tail, you know, the, obviously Spinosaurus has thicker limbs than Tyrannosaurus by a few times, so that tips it back a bit. The Spinosaurus's tail would certainly be heavier than a Tyrannosaurus tail, would be my guess. Um, and that's simply because, and you can see the cross-section in the latest Ibrahim 2020 study, that... In case anyone's wondering about the shape, it is not an eel tail. It is definitely not like a long skinny tail. It would be actually a lot like a crocodile's tail, only instead of having little spiny bits, which is what I depicted before, it would just yeah. have a sleek sail. So all it is, like at the base here, it's a pure thick tail that's round, like really thick and round, has huge quarter femoralis muscles, that muscle I cut. That's the muscle I won't shut up about. It's a very interesting muscle, and it's something that people don't, show enough understanding yeah. of in paleo art because you'll notice like a lot of reconstructions they have this sort of crease right here where the obviously the leg ends um and just goes into the hips that would be true minus the fact that this humongous muscle here actually connects the rear of the thigh to the tail and most of the tail here adding a huge amount of thickness and also ability to bend side to side uh, there's a one on Carnotaurus that really covers it well and analyzes, you know, Carnotaurus's anatomy. That said, if you want to take a shortcut, um, you can always check your dinosaurs are wrong with the Carnotaurus version. It explains it perfectly. I just re recommend watching it. Um, you know, if you wanted to learn about that muscle, that that um, covers it. But yeah, so they have a really thick round tail with a tiny little bit sticking up here for the sail. When it gets to around here, the caudal feeder moralis starts to shrink a bit, so it's sort of a skinnier tail, but it's sort of, you know, 
um, it's still more or less a rectangle shape with a tiny little point on, so I suppose yep. uh, maybe a hexagon or pentagon or whatever. And only towards the very tip, it's basically a triangle, but it's still a thick, fat triangle. So all that's happening is the tail is kind of showing a slight, you know, a reduction in thickness as a normal tail would, but it remains as tall. So as a result, the mass is higher and it's thicker. So that would pretty much add a lot of the weight on Spinosaurus. So yeah, that's yeah, roughly explained. As well, where it all goes, uh, that kind of accounts for it. The other interesting thing, which I obviously I've mentioned it to you off uh, the record, but uh, I will mention it on the record as well, just for other people who are not aware. There is a recent study, which unfortunately, if I remember correctly, does not include Spinosaurus because it used the uh, Hindlin material, which I do not believe we have any reliable sort of uh, ones from Spinosaurus, like from adults or whatever, you know, like there's just a whole confusion with that. And the, that's why I think it wasn't used. And uh, I believe Therizinosaurus was not used because it doesn't have any limb material, mm. not Hindlin material. So we, we need to be important is the back legs, the legs ones, not the four limbs. It's the legs that are important for that study. And what they have found, interestingly enough, from their sample is that Tyrannosaurus obviously comes up as the heaviest. Um, and uh, the second heaviest came down to, I believe it was um, Dinochirus. And uh, yep, I think that's a study, yeah. And I think this third one was uh, Giganotosaurus, and after that it was, I think, Tyrannotitan, which, interestingly enough, although it's very fragmentary, it had the Hindlin preserved, and um, that was good enough to kind of do it. And then I believe there was either something else or it was uh, Mapiosaurus. Mapiosaurus was surprisingly on a very lighter sort of spectrum, even though mm. dimensions, because it's a relatively well-preserved uh, animal, and has more skeletons, even like it's got more specimens known, in fact, than uh, Giganotosaurus, which is only yeah. a single specimen. But um, it's uh, yeah, it's considerably lighter. But dimension-wise, it's actually very much like a Giganotosaurus, and even the skull size is very close. So that's that. That was another thing that I found very fascinating uh, from that study. So we'll definitely need to put a link to it as well if I find a good link where it's openly available. Absolutely. That's, uh, I think I might have seen that one or there might have been a similar one, but yeah, it is very hard to gauge the weight of these animals. And Spinosaurus being such a weird, oddball animal with so many different dimensional changes really just makes that very same process a huge headache to do because as you can see, the legs are tiny. And yep. in case anyone's wondering about the possibility of it being Chimera, I will uh, release soon. I've actually decided to check something wondering what would happen if the legs, the hind legs and the whole tail were scaled up by 15%. So 115% of the overall size. And what I found is it's still exactly the same. It's just got a longer tail. I mean, the legs are now bigger, so you know it might shift it more to bipedalism, but there's reasons why I suspect that this second one might not actually be necessarily true because a lot of the proportions of the width of the bones in the dorsal area, I've picked sort of this one here, and the caudal area, like basically the first tailbone, yep. those, the, the different proportions, the tail's about 81% of the girth of the centrum of the um, dorsal. That difference is only 3% less than ichthyovenator. So, even though it's way more elongated, it's um, it's basically the same thickness of the different bones of that ichthyovenator skeleton. So that's something to consider. That could mean that this is actually how this animal's shaped, even with its tiny little legs. Well, not tiny; they're just short and stumpy, little power legs, and you know, elongated body, elongated neck, giant arms. So, and yes, and if anyone's wondering whether I'm still convinced it's a biped. Oh man, it's really hard to say. I've, I, th I sort of have this theory that I'm floating around that and I want to actually check this, but something I've noticed is this proportion, although more extreme, is kind of similar to, to the direction that Torvosaurus evolved to. And Torvosaurus also lives in a similar habitat. It lives near a lot of water. It lives like a, in a very wet wetland area. 
And I'm thinking, what if these two wetland areas happen to be something more like the Amazon River, you know, where there's more foliage, more obstacles, logs, branches, trees, stuff that, you know, an animal would actually need to climb around just to get around. And if that's the case, then maybe this was like a semi biped that constantly used its arms to clamber over things. And that's why they're so large and why the legs are so short. And when you think about it, you kind of see that in a lot of animals that live in such areas, their limbs become shorter, their bodies become sort of longer and slinkier, and they seem to be able to manage dense foliage better. I mean, Keep in mind, I have no idea if that's true. So this is just a yeah, yeah, it's just a suggestion now. Yeah, suggestion. So I'm be fun to actually find out. I'm going to try and look into this soon, and so I can you know start boasting about how oh, guys I managed to think of this and predict this, and I'm so smart, or whether it's just like now I couldn't find anything, so just take it with a grain of salt. So that's that. Um, yeah, I've done so much study on the Spinosaurus recently. I was working on this one alone for months, just because it's so weird. There's so many things I just I had to check. So tempted to uh, at some point plan maybe a sculpture of a spinal, but I'm just so like afraid of touching it in case it's there's something else that comes out and it's just gonna completely mm. like uh, take a dump all over it. And I just realized that I've spent so much money and time and everything, uh, you know, resources into that one piece that might just turn out to be completely off in every way. So I'm just yeah. not. Yes, I'll just go with the baryonyx instead. Yeah, fair enough. I, this is the one of the reasons I took so long to wait for this one because I was waiting for the arms to be released. But because MBL thirteen actually managed to show me some, you know, accurate, you know, isometric layout of the bones, I was able to just throw it up straight away and scale it to the. I think it's the manus. It's called the little finger bone here or here, and I just, you know, on the neotype, I um, yeah, just scaled the arm to that, and that's pretty much how big it would be. So I think. Overall, I am very certain that this is going to be pretty close to very accurate indeed. I am predicting, uh, well, I mean, obviously, just to kind of account into margin of errors and just generally how unpredictable paleontology mm -hmm. is in terms of what it discovers, I would bet, to make it extra safe, I would bet 60% that it's correct. And to make it a bit more generous, I would probably say about 80-ish. Yeah, I'd say that's fair. That's probably fair. I mean, I'd probably do something like that. But of course, it might turn out that it's actually very spot on, maybe like 90% close. But uh, again, I don't know. Uh, nobody knows. <laughs> so. Yeah, I'd say we'd have to get at least one more specimen where all the, re you know, more intact or at least covering so some um, portals and dorsal bits, you know, at least in this region, maybe an arm or two just uh you know absolutely solidify the proportions although an intact specimen that's completely together would be ideal it would just be like a dream come true a lottery literally yeah otherwise there's always a risk we'll get dinochirus again you know yeah yeah i was and, gonna we could get dinochirus all over again yeah yeah speaking of which um go to the I'm next probably, a very yes. good you have a good image so, you have mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. So here we have it. Um, speaking of which, that's Dinocarus there at the far end. I, I'm not, not inferring that it's bigger than Tyrannosaurus. It's just much taller, so it fit more easily in the back. So that's why it's there. That's all I'm doing. I don't really bother scaling things to their true predicted mass. I just scale them because one's taller and, and you know, isn't going to block the way of the other one. I recently am going to do one with adding right. Taurosaurus in. Yep. The important part is in the writing is what you've written across the names and that's what i think people should also pay attention to very closely absolutely so yeah i always don't want to lead people astray if i know if i can't be certain of a certain mass and i can't cite something you know someone more reliable than myself to back you know to actually make this claim I always try to put warnings in or or say, you know, this is me just spitballing, so just keep that in mind. I mean, I've done that with dino, um, Dinotherium, obviously, and although that's, I have a very good basis to assume that, but that's something I'll get to later because that's also here, but I'll just brush yeah. through it quickly. So, yeah, everything here is, um, you know, basically any contentious point I'll basically hammer out. So... Dinocarus is obviously the tallest theropod because it has a back that's like almost five meters tall. 
a Tyrannosaurus would have to really stretch up and lift its nose to reach that height at all, and Dinoceratops can just do that by comfortably standing. By basically I being. Dinoceratops hmm? <laughs> can do it by basically being Dinoceratops. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It's just by literally being there and just standing, it's towering over everything else. I must say, I can't confirm whether it had a thick coat of feathers. This is just me being approximate. Some people have suggested that because it was extra large, it wouldn't have feathers. And this is actually an interesting thing to cover. Size is only one factor for what the integument would be like. The other is surface area. And this is actually something you can test now. Look at a giraffe. Um, look at the size of a giraffe. You'll notice that the biggest giraffes are actually bigger or even the average draft is bigger than the and then a black rhino. However, the black rhino is ha pretty much hairless, while the draft has got a coat of fur, and that's because the draft has a bigger surface area. Mass creates heat, surface area releases heat. So if you have a lot of surface area, you're going to need to keep warm some other way, unless it's just such a hot climate, it doesn't matter. While if you've got more mass, you're basically big and bulky, you probably don't need hair as much or feathers or whatever because you just generate so much heat and release so little because you don't have all these extra elongated bits or wide bits of skin sticking out. It's just basically a big bundle of energy. That said, that study about Tyrannosaurus's, you know, feathers or scales, that's the Bell 2017 study, yep. actually found that there is no basis to assume or at least their best modelling attempts could not confirmed that Tyrannosaur ribs became scaly because of mass, because there's a good chance its common ancestor was actually smaller than Eutyrannus. So Eutyrannus was clearly a fully feathered animal. It's a pity I didn't depict it here. It would have been great. But um, Eutyrannus, yeah. uh, even the original description, actually never been able to make out the true nature of the integuments. So they just mm -hmm. assumed some kind of filament, and they just gave a broad stroke whether it's uh, even something that they can even define as a feather because we on this channel basically you will find especially if you're familiar with my contents especially oh, yes. when we start mulling it over it's like what is the feather and how do you basically define it and how how where do you draw the line between what is a feather and what is just a proto filament of any kind that's just yep. either ancestral or more primitive than a feather there's just so much um it's a mess, uh, to be honest. Mm. So when yeah. we refer, for the purpose of this discussion, just to make things shorter and easier, if we refer to something as a feather or filament or whatever, we may be occasionally making minor errors. Uh, so if we do, just don't spam the, ch the comments. <laughs> just yeah. so, so, so as a disclaimer, I'm basically generously calling any filament that has any kind of dispersed um, threads in any shape or form, a feather. Even if it's basically a root with a bunch of filament sticking straight out of it, I'm calling it a feather just for the sake of convenience for everyone else. So, but just to quickly cover that, yep. I want to capture that a dromaeosaur actually has true modern pinaceous feathers, just like a modern bird, just like a, an eagle or a minor bird, possibly a little more frayed because they might not have been as refined. But at this point, you would have something very similar to an ordinary modern bird. It would have had the sort of the wingy feathers. It would have had similar fluff all over it. It would have just been, at this point, a very typical bird-like feather for all intents and descriptions. That said, going further back, maybe it applies to the over-raptorids that they might have the sort of true feathers. But further back from that, you're just going to start getting proto-feathers and filaments and fuzz and just things that aren't really analogous to any modern feather. At best, they might be analogous to down, but I'm pretty sure that's just a modern pinaceous feather that derives some weird way. But just to get an idea, all these other dinosaurs, when they when we describe their feathers, we're describing some kind of fuzz, filaments, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very, basically, we'll, we're just going to be using umbrella terms here just to, to make it simple and easy so we don't have to spend another half an hour explaining what we mean. Yeah, that would actually be a good video for another time because I have a lot of things I'd like to talk about. But for now, I'm just glossing through. 
it's just yeah just a bit about body heat size oh, you, you and jeffrey are definitely like if i sit you down here and just be like okay introducing this guy introducing that guy come together for the first time um have at it i give you yes. plus minutes 30 plus minutes to just knock yourselves out and i'll just sit there oh, love it. eat snacks and you'll be kind of going at it <laughs> nice i love it so Anyway, so pretty much just covering the rest of them quickly. Um, obviously, everyone knows Tyrannosaurus. This is based on Scotty. Scotty is massive. Um, I meticulously reconstructed my model skeleton uh, myself, and then I kind of screwed up the chest and the arms, so I just borrowed random dinos' skeletons yeah, to fill okay. the rest. But um, I'm proud to say I 90% did it by myself. Including the skull, actually. The, the only discrepancy you might get is that this mouth might be a little too wide, like further back. It's probably realistically pushed forward a little bit because I'm not. I've, this is the problem with working in 2D. It is really hard to compute the lateral space. Like, this is why my um, upcoming Shastasaurus is taking so long. It's because I just don't have the easy means. But I've found a few ways I could possibly do it. Don't know if it'll work, but yeah, I'm just working in 2D, you know, up and down and back to front space. I can't really do side to side at the moment. So this is probably the only real discrepancy. Everything else is probably going to be pretty accurate. It probably was 13 meters long, which actually makes it the pretty much the largest and heaviest of all these theropods, as well as more or less the longest that you see here. I haven't been able to cover all the theropods yet, especially the big ones. That's just takes time and yeah, I need to find really good. Gignotosaurus, as you can see, is actually a little bit shorter than Tyrannosaurus using the exact same posture. And the reason I use the same posture is one part to show something consistency, the other part just because I'm lazy and I like to do the same posture because it's easy. Um, I, I usually copy and paste scale patterns and that just saves me a huge amount of trouble if it's like, oh yeah, just stretch it a bit to the proportions and I'm done. But as you can see, similar proportion, similar pose. Um, it's actually a little bit shorter. And this is me saying, oh, no, I'm, you know, everyone's saying, that, you know, Tyrannosaurus is tall. They're being silly. I'm going to show them. And then I showed myself instead. So I decided just to put this up just to, you know, again, learn something new. Yeah, this is a very interesting point uh, about their size comparisons is that even if you look at some of the reconstructions by Francisco, shout out to Franois, because uh, yep, uh, yeah, there we go. Hello there, if you're watching. But uh, yeah, he's been a guest on my channel as well a long time ago, and uh, he talked a little bit about his reconstructions and how he, the methods that he was using, you know, to come to the conclusion. So I generally trust him on this oh, portions. And what I found to be particularly fascinating is that every single, even younger. T-Rex specimen, we're talking like AMNH 5027, we're talking Stan, we're also looking at a uh, couple others that were, you know, considered to be on a sort of smaller adult size, you know, uh, for T-Rex. They, they all consider consistently come out, if, you, if using the same methods, obviously, of reconstructing the mass and the postures, uh, if you consistently stick with, say, Franois methods, he came to the conclusion that, uh, they are taller at the hips, every single one of them, than a Giganotosaurus. And also, they are slightly heavier than Giganotosaurus mm. in mass, even though they are not on the bigger size of the scale in terms of uh, as far as Tyrannosaurus goes. And they're also not the uh, oldest uh, in terms of the adults. And if you start looking at things like Sue and Scotty, and then you start also looking at other skull uh, materials like the LACM uh, skull, the older specimen, and also the MOR008. Or if you look at uh, the Netherlands specimen, Trix, and the privately owned mm -hmm. uh, Tristan as well, which had quite a big skull and it was quite a big specimen as well. You can already see quite a few of them out there that are just really big and they're considerably, you could even argue they're bigger than uh, Giganotosaurus uh, in terms of the mass specifically and maybe even their hip height proportions. Oh, yeah. Dimensions wise, they are probably the same range. You would be talking about 12 point something meters, give or take mm. the margin of error. They, they, you could probably be safe uh, with that. But uh, it's very interesting to note how much they mimic each other's proportions, though. Yep. Oh, speaking of which, this is very important, just in case. So, a lot of people, um, obviously, you know, 
here and there would probably have some kind of bias in scaling one animal to the other. And one of the fun things I like to do about my skeletal, my reconstructions, is to try to mitigate as much bias as I can. And one of the handy things about my lazy copy paste method is I've already established proportions, I think, of suit the skeleton of one. The fact that I'm carrying it over and just kind of stretching it to fit the bones means I'm already eliminating a lot of bias against myself. And not that I'd actually do it, but I just treat it as an extra bonus. So everything that you see is just me doing a bottom up of everything, blindly assuming, you know, just connecting muscle to bone in the way that, you know, anatomically I expect it to. And, you know, just like the musculature around the arms, I always repeat for every animal so that they should have the same expected amount of girth on their arms and legs and tail and body and neck and stuff. So there's no, you know, top down assumptions of, oh, I bet this animal's a bit skinny, I'll make it a little slimmer, I bet this animal's thicker, I'll make it a bit thicker. It's basically like every neck you see, for example, it's just me connecting the coracoid, I think, the scapular coracoid area to the chin, to the base of the jaw. That's all I do. This is pretty much just connecting the bones to the bones. And all these differences in thickness and mass are purely just accidental that I arrived at. Yep. I wanted to ask you a question if it's something that you are able to answer. Um, sure. That how much, if you can pinpoint it, do you believe you have in terms of the margin of error? What would you give it if there is any way you can give a measurable, quantifiable, you know, number to it at all? Um, so I'd say there's always a margin of error, and I just assume that that's always the case. I think probably for me, if there's any bits that I fill in, I'd say the margin of error could probably get away with individual differences. So I definitely, so there's none of these would absolutely be perfect. Um, they would be more or less approximate that the size would actually reasonably reflect the potential that each of these animals can grow to with the known specimen. Sometimes I hear of large ones and I just add the lazy disclaimer that it could have been larger because I just wasn't able to find and scale it up myself. So I just, you know, leave that possibility open. Um, but yeah, for all the different parts where I usually substitute, you know, other dinosaurs in if necessary, the closest relatives I can find or, um, or slight differences in girth, thickness, fat levels. There is a very bit of variability, but I'm pretty sure it's safe. So I, that's usually my rule of thumb. If I don't worry too much about that. I want to make sure it's not ridiculously, you know, proposing something outlandish. I just want to make sure that any possible disproportions are within the possibility that the animal could actually achieve those disproportions between individuals. And I just leave it at that and everything. And if I, you know, feel it's especially contentious, I'll just say, yeah. Also, by the way, I did this. Keep in mind, yeah, so don't... Uh, to, you know, take that particular part too seriously if you find anything better. Yeah, that's fair. So basically, it's more or less that it's just a matter of uh, knowing that, yes, there is going to be a margin of error and it will vary yep. based on individual variations of what you use because sometimes you need to use a collective of specimens to restore the animal because of the completeness or lack of. So there is that point to consider as well. So you're not always using the complete specimens of each and individual um, piece to recover and reconstruct, so. Yep, that's right. And so yeah, that's pretty much always gonna be the case. It's uh, try and find the most intact specimens I can find. And actually, if anyone's wondering why I've never touched a, or depicted a certain dinosaur before, the simple reason is I haven't really been able to find um, enough skeleton you know, photos, scientific diagrams. And I try to keep my, um, pinching of, you know, Franois, Random Dinos and Scott Hartman's material to a minimum because I feel like I'm just being, <laughs> being mean, constantly pilfering their stuff. And sometimes I just like to try and find out on my own what I can find. Like uh, Maposaurus, for example, is something I've always wanted to do. I know there's, you know, a lot of articles describe a bit of the skeletons, but uh, honestly, I need the diagrams and pictures and photos of the fossils to really work with. Because I find 
you know, written descriptions can be incredibly misleading sometimes, or they could be based on something that, you know, might be a bit of an estimate for different reasons. But yeah, it's something I wanted to try and find myself just because I can, you know, find whether the two very different depictions of Jigen, of um, Mathosaurus, you know, how they could come about, how, it's, how you know, they were arrived at. And I thought it'd be fun to try it myself because either which way, it'll be very, very interesting to see what could be found with it. But yeah, that's pretty much it. I only usually depict animals that I have a safe basis to reconstruct it. And mm -hmm. and usually I would just like to be lazy and find ones based on complete skeletons that have already known top to bottom to science. So I'm like, yeah, this is easy. So, But sometimes I like to challenge myself and find ones that are more obscure just to see what I can find from it. And I have like a huge backlog of animals that I, you know, will depict down the line. But usually I just start from the easiest ones to get materials from. Yeah, so pretty much. Mm. I mean, uh, that's what I would do if I were to do sculpting. I would just try to see if I can find something that is relatively easy to find and trace and verify as well. Because a lot of times uh, things are not, um, you know, they may even have specimens for them to represent them, but they're just really hard to verify or uh, with the authors who describe them. Mm. Or you know, yeah. you're just not always going to be able to like fly over to say like Mongolia or whatever or China and just like look at the specimens yourself and take pictures. So mm. it, oh, Kazakhstan, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, we have had that sort of thing, which we have miraculously resolved, which we'll get to in a moment. But um, mm -hmm. I want to quickly ask you a question. Yeah. I want to ask you, how did you come to the conclusion for the estimate of Carnotaurus between eight to nine meters? How was that uh, something that you achieved? Um, so basically, so as everyone knows, the tail of a Carnotaurus is substantially missing as it's, as are its feet. Um, this is basically just, uh, you know, somewhere between Bonaparte's and Scott Hartman's depictions. I sort of, you know, um, sized up a bit of both. They more or less arrived at that. And I think probably from reconstructing other tales, I'm usually not too worried about the tales myself because they can vary in length very easily. It probably could be longer. I think I just kind of decided to go with the more conservative length and just left it at that. So yeah, that one, I just kind of just went for the conservative uh, to someone else's reconstruction for that. I wasn't really able to um, piece it up myself, but then again, I probably could try and identify the closest relatives that do have intact tails. And, and what I would do is probably scale up and see, which I might do in the future, because that's a very good idea. But often, I think with these days, I don't really worry about estimated length so much. I just grab the bones I do have, reconstruct it, say, oh, yeah, the, I did this tail. It probably could be a bit longer, a bit shorter. And But that said, the size you see overall is actually the size of the fossils. The missing parts are just me filling them in, using other reconstructions. Yeah, that's fair enough. Uh, the, the, recons the reason I asked on this is because the most common value that I found for Carnotaurus was like 7.8, which is nearly 8 uh, meters, I think, but they don't actually say whether it's like the maximum or the minimum or whether they give it like a stretch. It's just like this pinpointed figure that I always come across with. So that's why I was very curious. How did you arrive to this, uh, to this smart, you know, to this point? And uh, yeah. the tail may be yeah. a massive factor, actually. Yeah, it could actually be quite a bit longer. That said, I took the lazy option and just winged that particular length using other reconstructions. The best method should be to cite um, the next, you know, an abelosaurid that's closely related to Carnotaurus and just rescale its tail to fit the proportions of the known tailbones of Carnotaurus, of which there are quite a few, but obviously the back is missing. Yeah, I'm sure it's pretty close, but... Yeah, I guess nine meters is probably, you know, it's usually the the longest estimates I've seen and that they're probably pretty valid, I'd say. It's um it would just basically be how long is the tail. It would be really nice to see more Carnotaurus specimens out there, wouldn't it? You know, to establish oh, yeah. a bit of a, a chain there, you know, in terms of the age related things and stuff mm -hmm. like that, because we only have one specimen and we're even lucky that we have this one already, which yeah, a lot of things, you know, which we can get into at some point as well, um, because there's a lot of stuff to talk about in terms of the preservation and the noted 
descriptions of things that are revealed in this specimen that was found. So there are a couple of people I know as well who would definitely love to dive into this as well. So we could get a nice oh, yeah. hangout on the Carnotaurus alone. <laughs> Absolutely. So, I'm pretty sure that the, the I was gonna say the chat, but not the chat, but the, the comment section is gonna probably have a few people who would like to, you know, like Carnotaurus fans or something like that, you know, who would love to have a video dedicated to Carnotaurus and just do like a group hangout and talk oh, about absolutely. it. Absolutely. So yeah, I'm uh, overall quite happy with everything else. I've noticed. Oh yes, I've noticed you also got Sorafagonix, which is basically possibly maybe an Allosaurus of yep. either. A fragilis, which is just bigger, or it may be just uh, Allosaurus maximus, which would be just a different species of a larger species of Allosaurus. Yeah. And the tricky thing about Allosaurus, there are so many yet unofficially uh, undescribed species, uh, you know, proposed, and there are only, I believe, I would say there are three that are sort of more or less officially accepted, with one of them, I think, being slightly more dubious. And there are two yep. North American species and one European species, apparently. Yep, and, and that was actually the tenth or something. <laughs> yeah, that's um, an Allosaurus is an interesting one. I do want to depict some of the other species one day, but I picked Saurophaganex in particular because you know we keep saying, oh, it's an Allosaurus-y looking thing that's the size of Tyrannosaurus because it's probably twelve meters long, and oh, you know, and it's yeah. And I decided, you know, I want to see that. That's it's going to be interesting. It'll be pretty cool if there was an Allosaurus that was the size of a Tyrannosaurus. This is probably the biggest Allosaurus, Allosaurine you're probably going to find so far. Maybe there's some a little bit bigger. As you can see, not only is at similar lengths is it not as big as Tyrannosaurus, but it's not even as big as like <laughs> a lot of Carcharodontosaurs either, like including Acrocanthosaurus and Gignotosaurus. It's basically uh, the trick. The tricky thing about Allosauroidea family overall is that there are many similar-looking on the outside animals, but uh, there is like a bunch of them that are metric Antosauridae, which tend to be slightly more uh, of an earlier Jurassic in comparison, you know, to the actual true Allosauridae, which are much later, you know, in the Jurassic, which come almost to the end of the Jurassic, and uh, they. The animals like Yanquanosaurus, Shag Shaguiensis, whatever the name it is, it's I always break my tongue uh, trying to pronounce the both the genus and the species name. It's like giving me a headache. But anyway, they they are on a bigger spectrum from those animals. But even then, you know, the biggest estimate was 11 meters, and uh, the more kind of moderate estimate is like nine and a half, ten meters in length for the largest potential specimens for Yanquanosaurus. And that's considered mm -hmm. quite large and probably larger than you would find the most sort of Allosaurus specimens out there. And um, absolutely, sort of action uh, in particular, based on what is known, not much to be honest. It's only like leg. bits from the leg, maybe a few parts of the vertebrae, and uh, there's really not a lot. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, regretfully, we don't have the skull. Mm, yeah. So this is basically just. On the assumption that it is an Allosaurus, because the bones themselves look pretty much like Allosaurus bones, but for all we know, we might just get a skull and it's completely different. So that's basically why they're sort of also in the dark about what exactly it is. It's a bit like that Brazilian Carnotaurian uh, Abelisaurid that's known, uh, what's it called, with a P, Pycnonimosaurus or something like that. Uh, oh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> it's potentially contesting or exceeding the size of uh, Carnotaurus, but again, because of the fragmentary remains, and also it doesn't have a skull either, so there's mm -hmm. like a lot of piece, pieces that are also missing from it, and yeah, it's just too hard to say what it is in terms oh, of... That would be so tantalizing. I've always... So I have this little secret fascination of what if there were super large size abelosaurs in like the carnotaurus -y kind of you know, stumpy-armed Variety because abelosaurs vary in all kinds of sh shapes and sizes. Some even actually still seem to have real arms. And oh, in case anyone's wondering, Carnotaurus legitimately, unlike Tyrannosaurus, you know, Tyrannosaurus has short arms for its size, but they are very strong arms. They can bench press their own body weight, and that isn't a study I'll be covering, you know, in the future. 
Um, Carnotaurus, however, and many abelosaurs, their arms are legitimately atrophied. They sh they are shrinking. They are losing feeling. They don't even really have real elbows anymore. They just kind of have like this long shoulder with a bunch of hands. Like, you know, we have these phantom limbs, you know, when they're present, but they're not functional. They're just not, they're just like dingling around, just basically yeah. in a fixed position yeah. for us, which is very, yeah. there is something very interesting for you, uh, my friends, mm -hmm. about the ability for it. And that's the one I have my eyes on and I'm trying to, I'm waiting to see if there's going to be a name description for it because there has been a recent, I think, paper on uh, on uh, abelisauroid. I don't know how in terms of where it fits in the family specifically, but there was an abelisauroid, mm -hmm. so it's more of a general umbrella term, obviously, so it's quite vague, but it's pretty big. It oh, could wow. actually be um, as big as in the range of, you would say, uh, just to be safe, the Splitosaurus, maybe. Oh, wow. That Which is impressive. impressive. That would be like bigger than any other Abelisauroid known. And uh, yeah, because if you talk about the Splitosaurus, we're talking like roughly, it's big. I mean, the Splitosaurus is bigger than an Allosaurus as well. It, yep. it, no, you know, it's like nine meters length, but it weighs like three plus tons or something like that, which is much heavier. Oh, yeah. Like, basically a shrunk down Tyrannosaurus, really. Very much, yeah, yeah, you would say that. So you would basically be looking, like obviously not quite the Tarbosaurus maybe size yet. Tarbosaurus would be a bit on an extreme side, but we're definitely looking, you know, reliably safely margin of error, you know, looking at about the Splitosaurus plus minus size. So oh, that would be We would have yet to see something though. It's I think it's from Africa. I don't remember exactly mm. the part of Africa. And I think it is... Uh, an equivalent stratigraphically in terms of the age to the uh, Madagascar of uh, late Maastrichtian of where the mm -hmm. uh, forest was around. So we're nice. talking the equivalence of the stratigraphy roughly about that time. Is that a Trixis or what? I don't remember its name, but you know, I'm talking about the Trixis. I haven't this one a name yet, so we don't uh, know. It's, that's what I'm trying to find out if there has been a, any name because I want to know what it is because apparently there is a somewhat decent you know percentage of the skeleton that's preserved you know it's like it's not amazing but there are parts of skull there are parts of nice. like I think and the torso the ribs and maybe even some parts of the tail so there is you know something to work with I'm really excellent but that that thing could be quite a dragon as well you know so we don't know it'd be fascinating as well because. All the other very large dinosaurs, they tend to have large, elongated skulls, you know, sort of more robust bodies, um, obviously limbs capable of supporting their own weight, yet a lot of abelosaurs seem to have a completely different body shape that may or may not support gigantism in the same way. And so if it somehow does, that would make, you know, rewrite quite a few of my assumptions about those animals. So that's probably why I'm so interested to see if they can actually do it. Yeah, they were the top predators known, at least uh, from that area, it, you know, because uh, in terms of the theropods and predatory theropods that were dominant in that time period, we're talking like almost all the way, basically Maastrichtian, which is the very last uh, few million years, like 71 and all the way onwards to the extinction. and. Uh, that time period tends to be pretty much focused in terms of the large predators. It's Tyrannosauridae and we have Abelisauridae, depending on which area of the globe we poke in. So if you look at North America, that's uh, um, Tyrannosauridae. If you look at certain parts of Asia or Eurasia, I would say probably, although more on the Asian part, I would assume that's also Tyrannosauridae. Some parts of Asia, like India, were abelisauridae, and uh, then you look at Europe, there are some abelisaurids, although not properly described. And you have Africa and Madagascar, which are known to have abelisauridae as well. What I don't know, and what I don't think anybody knows for sure, and that's something that you can tell us, is mm -hmm. whether there is anything known from the dinosaurs of that specific time period from Australia, which I've not heard of anything yet. Well, as a matter of fact, um, unfortunately, our knowledge of our own theropods is incredibly limited. The only really solidly known theropod is like a few bones, and it's called Australovenator. And 
I'm not 100 percent sure what it is. It could be a mega raptor. It could be mega raptor down. Mm, I think so. It's uh, it's probably about six meters long. It has a slim sort of build. You know, the pretty large, sharp teeth, large claws, large. You know, it was certainly a very formidable predator. But that's really the only one we know about, and even then, we only have a few bones of it. There are. Okay, so I remember in Walking with Dinosaurs, they tried to discuss some kind of hypothetical Australian allosauroid. Allosaurid. I have no idea if any such thing exists. I've been looking for it for ages, and so far, it seems. Sorry? I haven't found anything either. No, no, no. Uh, it seems that it was just either mistaken with the Australovenator uh, or it was just something else they made up. Oh, there is something that I can, can confirm is a mistaken um, case of mistaken identity. They did find a very large footprint that looks like a theropod footprint. Huge. Like this thing would have been absolutely monstrously massive. However, it turns out it is the Mudabotosaurus. And a Mudabotosaurus is an ornithischian dinosaur. I think that's... It's a rhabdodontid, I think, uh, ornithopod. So it's ornithopod. kind of very close sort of uh, relationship with the iguanodon alike. Mm. Yeah. So quite the same family, but they are related. Yes. Yeah, so it's um, now this is an interesting thing with Australia is this continent has probably been one of the most perpetually isolated parts of the world throughout almost its entire history of having tetrapods living on it. The um, it's probably during the early Jurassic that water levels and the shape of the continent it was like only attached to Antarctica and South America by a thread. And often throughout its ages, this geographical range changed a lot. And as a result, even when it was actually still attached to um, Gondwana, the supercontinent, it was only tenuously so. So it was always relatively isolated. We have, um, I remember you discussed a while back the differences between the two groups of ankylosaurs, the um, I don't remember what they're called, but we actually have a late lasting proto ankylosaur um, called Mimni, and that actually has the pre divergent ancestral traits of the ankylosaur family group that have just been retained into like some ridiculously late point in the Mesozoic, like possibly, the, I don't remember exactly, but it very much outlived, you know, the point where ankylosaurs well and truly diverged into the two families. So, so um, there is Minni and there is actually, I think it has a later descendant as well, if the observations and the publications were indeed correct on their descriptions. It's also called Combarasaurus. Oh so yeah, I haven't heard that one. There, they, in fact, Canberrasaurus was either mistaken with Minmi or it was mistaken with a subspecies or species of Minmi, but I think they've been uh, now placed in different uh, genuses. And uh, they are similarly sized animals, I believe, with a few give or takes, and uh, mm. they have different skulls, I'm pretty sure. Yep. And there's something else that I can't remember, but Canberrasaurus, in fact, actually does show some nice, interesting insides of the skull as well, which helps... Uh, uh, to understand, you know, their anatomy a little bit better. Mm, that's pretty cool. I have to look into it. Definitely look it up if you can. Sometime. Mm, I will. But yeah, I think as far as our dinosaurs go, we do have some very large sauropods. Obviously, not brachiosaurid size, although some of them are pretty massive. I don't remember the proper scientific names of them. They just got their Australianized nicknames like Banjo and Matilda and. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm thinking of the tilde. Um, uh, and anyone's wondering why we call them that, we have a our, our nationally revered poet's name is Banjo Patterson. He's made a song called Waltzing the Tilda. So if you keep hearing those things, that's why. So that's pretty much all it is. It's Waltzing the Tilda is not our national anthem, even though people insist it should be. It's it's a song about a guy who steals a sheep and jumps in the water escape the police i am not making this up this is actually his most famous song and people want that to be the national anthem and it's actually a very mainstream sentiment it's not just like a you know like a 4chan you know this would be funny sentiment it's like a very uniform this should be our national anthem our actual national anthem stupid let's make it a fun one so 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> That's a bit of divergence of Australian culture, but yes, we named, uh, I'm trying to remember, it was something Daimondosaurus or something Daimondus. Um, so we had two very large recently discovered sauropods that were probably about Diplodocus size. Right. Maybe Camerasaurus size, but that's, um, and we have a lot of, you know, small bipedal dinosaurs, I, which I don't remember, but I think Mudabarosaurus, um, that giant one, we, the Iguanodon-esque one we have is an interesting one because it's also incredibly massive. Yeah. It would definitely be on par with the largest Iguanodonts and probably more or less Edmontosaur sized as well. It would be kind of uh, on the lower end uh, on Edmontosaurus. Mm -hmm. Edmontosaurus, they get pretty big overall, especially mm -hmm. I think regardless uh, the type of species, they get pretty big. And mm -hmm. Anectans get pretty big too, but the biggest, you know, I've heard that there's an Edmontosaurus Anectans that supposedly there are specimens which are as big, you know, like rare, like outlander specimens. Oh, yeah reach like Shantungasaurus level sizes. Yes. But when I, I have that one, find, you know, verifications, I cannot find anything. And uh, that's why I'm just not sure if I can trust it. It was just something that somebody said and that was it. And I don't trust rumors, you know me. So but if there is something, I'd like to see it. But uh, yeah. Iguanodon, uh, we have a good specimen here in Britain. Obviously, it's a British dinosaur and mm -hmm. uh, it's very big. And it's not just big because, I mean, in length, you're talking like 10 meters probably nine to ten meters length but oh, that's insane but it's not just that it's that it's massive oh yeah it, it's an absolute i would say it's like it's like an arnold schwarzenegger of the ornithopod dinosaurs in oh, yeah its forelimbs are also massive you know with these like big knuckles things whatever like you know and it's got the thumb spikes there that are just like they're like about this size they're really big you know they're huge and uh, yeah mutaborosaurus i think approaches it closely we're talking probably about eight meters, but there's mm. this, based on what I've heard, because I've never seen the specimen, you know, I haven't had the chance and uh, I've never seen the casts or anything like that. I can only reliably tell you that Iguanodon is definitely a massive dinosaur. It's huge oh, because yeah. it's face to face. It's ridiculous. Yeah, that's something I'm excited about depicting one day as well and being based on very complete specimen, you know, it'll just be a matter of time. Yeah, no, no, it's definitely like it's one of the, uh, you know, iconic European dinosaurs overall, Iguanodon, it's like it's insane. So do you want to know, go to the next uh, thread or are you, have you got some oh, more things? Sure. Um, so I'll probably just leave this one and pretty soon by just pointing out, if anyone's wondering how big Euteranosaur is, it'll be slightly larger dimensions than the Carnotaurus, while Torvosaurus actually seems to be smaller, at least... Um, the Torvosaurus I depicted is, um, oh God, I forgot the name of it. It's um, the American one. What's the American one? Sorry? Tenere or Tenere. It depends how you Ten, Yes, it. Tenere or Tenere. tenere. I pronounce it with the Latin, so it's pro proper Latin pronunciation would be Tenere. But uh, Ooh, nice. uh, yeah, so, I mean, they would actually, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, the Italian or Spanish speakers, anybody who basically speaks Latin will confirm this, but I think it would be something completely odd like we don't use it in english it would be like torbosaurus taneri or something like that <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah, so true. True. um but the uh oh, damn i forgot the other one the european one from portugal would actually yeah, probably yeah. be um smaller than sorophaginax um it would be similar length but because it's like a slinky shorter legged slimmer body thing it would be smaller but um that myth, that one that something Rex one would probably be a little bit bigger. Right. So that's just rough scaling. I should have actually included them in this picture, but again, I forgot. So yeah. sorry, everyone. It'll happen later. So moving on. 